Hey guys, so today we're going to be going over some leather working basics. Uh, we're going to make a little project here, a little wrist cuff uh, that we've got a little kit for. Um, makes it convenient because all the tools will be in the same place. Uh, you can get these same tools at Tandy and Weaver and all sorts of leather supply places. Uh, but uh, if you want, you can also pick up one up from us. We got a link down in the comments. The steps that we do in here, you'll probably use in about 80% of all leatherworking projects. Uh, most leatherworking projects, even when they get larger in scope and scale, um, they'll use the same steps repeated on a uh, more complicated pattern, um, but uh, it's really only the patterning that changes. Um, so when we unbox one of these things, we'll have several things we'll be working with. Obviously we've got some dye and a clear coat, uh, some things to apply those. Uh, we'll need to be able to set some eyelets, so we've got an eyelet setter. Uh, we'll need to punch some holes, so there'll be a rotary hole puncher. Um, the decorations they'll be put on there are called conchos, that's what this guy is. Uh, a rivet setting tool for setting that concho. Uh, we'll need a beveler because we're going to be beveling all these edges to make them a little bit rounded. A uh, slicker so they'll be smooth and silky against our skin. And then of course we will have our workpiece that we're going to be turning into the actual wrist cuff that we'll be making. Um, the leather piece inside the kit here is quite a bit larger than you'll probably need. Uh, so the first thing you're going to want to do is cut this thing down to size. Um, most people cutting leather, if you're just starting off at a new hobby, probably not going to want to go out and buy a bunch of crazy tools. So usually just a box cutter is fine for uh, cutting leather. Wrap it around your wrist one time, make sure you get the right size for it. You want it to butt up against each other, but you do not want it overlapping. You can have about a finger's width gap in between, uh, but that's about as much as you want. Just mark how much you need to chop off there. And if you've got a box cutter or a pair of like, well, obviously we use leather shears, but a uh, box cutter will cut it just fine. Trim off the extra that you need there. And I like to kind of take off the corners as well, just so we don't have little stabby bits. All right, so now that we got our sized workpiece, first thing we're gonna wanna do is take our beveler, and we've got other videos to explain in more detail how bevelers work and the different types, but for the sake of this video, pretty much you just wanna line one of the two forks on each side of this corner and press it along and peel off this little edge here. So pretty much what we're doing is we're turning a square cut edge into a kind of a hexagonal edge. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna make it easier for us to burnish, which will be the next step after we have it beveled. Now you wanna be careful that you keep this, the each fork kind of evenly spaced. You don't wanna lean it too far one direction or the other because this direction you can end up gouging one of the forks into the leather. This direction you won't end up taking as much of a bite off of the actual, uh, the corner itself. Now you're gonna to wanna to do all four corners or all four edges on the grain side of the leather. And then you're gonna to wanna to flip it over and you're gonna to wanna to do the same thing on the flesh side. Now whenever you're beveling, you wanna bevel away from your hand. Uh, there's a kind of a tendency when you're trying to keep a grip on this thing that you kinda of wanna squeeze them together. But if you're beveling towards your fingers, if this thing slips off of the corner, if you're going this direction and it gets up under your fingernail or something, then you're gonna lose your interest in leather working real quick because that doesn't feel too good. So once you got all the edges done, you're ready to move on to our next step, which is slicking each one of these. So leather is trainable with anything liquid pretty much. Uh, veg tan is pretty easy to convince to be different shapes or finishes. So instead of using some kind of slicking compound, which you know makes, makes uh, burnishing quite a bit easier, um, you can just, honestly, you can just use water if you really want to. Um, but the dye, the liquid in this dye is really plenty to burnish this edge. So what we're going to do is apply it to just one edge at a time. 
And then we take this guy, which is a burnishing wheel or a slicker, depending on who you ask. And then you just apply pressure and friction on each of these edges. And so what we're doing here is we're basically making all those fibers lay down nice and smooth. Because once we have this against our skin, it being rounded and smooth is really going to be a benefit to how comfortable it is. But you're going to want to do all four edges. And the only real reason to do the edges first before you dye the whole face of it uh, is just because you're going to be handling this thing. If you've dyed the whole face of it already, then you're putting your fingers in a, a bunch of dye. Which leather dye won't hurt you, but it will stick to you for a while. And you can continue to burnish it until it gets completely dry. Basically that friction is heating it up and drying it. And uh, if you completely dry it with the friction, it'll start looking almost like this is a brown dye, but it'll look almost black and glassy if you burnish it all the way to dry it out, which a lot of times is just the look that people are going for. Nice and smooth. All right. So now that we got all those edges done, we can go ahead and dye the face of it. There's lots of different methodologies you can use for, for dyeing. Um, personally, when I'm using a brown, I kind of like to use linear strokes, kind of uneven-like, um, because when it dries, it kind of simulates wood grain, which I think looks pretty cool. There's lots of different ways you can go about it. You can do little impact daubs, uh, with uh, especially if it's like blues or, or grays and you can make it look like um, marble or you can do swirls and kind of make it look like tie-dyed or clouds or something like that but not much trick to to dine pretty pretty self-explanatory uh, you probably want to let this sit for just a while to dry before we put the clear coat on um, so we're gonna go ahead and do the rest of the steps uh, to kind of give it that that time to dry so the next thing we're going to want to do is go to our rotary hole puncher here. And we're going to lace this thing closed. So we're going to put three holes down each side. You can tell you could spin this thing and uh, change the diameter hole punch size. And the one we're going to want to use for the holes on the sides is the second to largest. Uh, which the largest is easy to find because it's next to the smallest and there's one after that. And so what I usually do is I'll punch my holes in the corner first because I want a total of three on each side. And you want four or five millimeters away from the edges so that you've got enough material there to pull against. Uh, you don't have to worry about tearing it out when you put some pressure on it. Um, but punching the corners first and then kind of eyeballing the center is usually how I go about making sure they're even. And we're going to put some eyelets in these holes, which basically is like a little metal protective uh, tube that gets crimped down inside here, which is not really, uh, it's really thin metal, so it's not really structural, but uh, the purpose of it is so that you can pull laces in and out of it over and over and over without the laces slowly eating away, basically causing friction on the inside of these leather holes and uh, chewing away at it over time. Uh, we're also going to put a little decoration in the center of it, uh, which is called a concho which concha is basically just a fancy word for doodad. Um, so <laughs> I'm gonna mark the center of it, which is pretty easy to do with wet leather. You can just dig your fingernail into it. Um, and the conchos are set with rivet posts, which are usually the second or third uh, si uh, uh, diameter size on the hole punch. All right, so next I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to set the eyelets in this thing just so we get as many steps in as we can uh, while letting the piece dry. Uh, one of the tricks for setting eyelets, or for setting anything really, is that you want a solid, uh, sturdy work surface to hit it on because these are all hammer striking tools. You can buy all kinds of other setters that are uh, compression based um, or like a arbor press or a hand press or that kind of thing. Uh, which will make your life a whole lot easier. Uh, but, you know, if this is just a new hobby for you and you don't want to drop, you know, fifty, hundred dollars $100 for uh, new tools, then uh, probably a striker tool is a good place to start. Uh, so using the second to largest hole punch setting on that hole puncher will make it so that these holes are just big enough to get the eyelets in there 
without letting them fall back out. So you don't really have to balance it or you know be real careful with it. Um, the the eyelet setter has an anvil that it comes with that's got a little recess in it that will hold the pretty side of the eyelet. So you can set it down on there. And then you just get your tool based on the opposite side. You do the whole thing with it upside down. And then you just whack it with a hammer. And voila. We got a set eyelet. Now we got six of these to do. All right, now the next thing is the little concho that goes on the middle there. And this is basically just an overgrown rivet is all it is. So the second to the uh, second or third to the smallest setting size is what we wanted for this guy. And the post will just go down through it and this little rivet cap snaps to the back and it'll more or less stay by itself too. So you don't have to juggle a whole lot of things and balance them. Um, your rivet setter also comes with its own anvil that's got a little bit of a dome to it rather than that little recessed groove. Uh, so we place that on top of our solid surface. If you got a really solid table you don't really need a metal block or anything but this table is really a cutting table so it bounces a little bit so this, uh, this steel block really helps keep it from moving that much. So you'll notice with the rivet setter it's got a domed kind of slightly domed side and then a flat side. The dome side is supposed to go against the, the rivet itself, or in this case, the concho. And the same thing as setting the eyelet, you just kind of flatten it on all there is to it. Now we're using an alcohol-based dye, so it's drying pretty quick. Um, generally speaking, you want to make sure that your workpiece is decently dry before you apply a clear coat to it. Uh, just because the ability to absorb that clear coat is based on osmosis. So if it's already wet, um, then those cells have already kind of sucked up as much um, liquid as they are capable of, um, and your clear coat won't go as far down in there. Um, it's not particularly important if you're just making a, a cosmetic piece, because uh, a lot of times you want most of the clear coat to sit on the surface anyway, just because you're trying to make it shinier. Um, but if you're worried about like rain repellent and dye bleed, you want to actually make sure you get some of that uh, clear coat down in there to lock in those pigments. So this is called acrylic resiline, which is the clear coat we typically use. Um, and you want to apply that with the foam brush. You have a little cotton dauber for, um, for putting the dye on, but for the clear coat, you want to use the foam brush. Uh, just because the little cotton dauber is basically just a big tangle, I guess it's actually wool, but it's just a big tangle of fibers. And if you've ever gotten like a cat hair and polyurethane or something like that, it's kind of the same situation. You lose little bitty fibers all in the clear coat and then you got to try and get them back out of the clear coat so it doesn't interrupt the, the sheen. Uh, the foam brush is one solid piece basically, so you don't have to worry about uh, little fibers coming out of it. Um, I always start with the edge first, just so I remember to do it. Um, the fact that you've burnished it down does make it a little less likely for the, the dye to bleed from the edge, um, but uh, it's, still, it's still beneficial to, to get a little bit of it on there. Not to mention the clear coat actually kind of uh, solidifies the edge a little bit more so that you don't have to worry about it coming, uh, like over time, getting worn back to a, a furry kind of state. Uh, so with the, the acrylic resiline, the trick is kind of that you want to keep it moving around while you can tell that it's white. So it's a white liquid to start with, uh, but it dries clear. So while you're applying it, uh, you want to keep it in motion so that you get an even distribution of it. But once you can't tell it's white anymore, once it looks more or less clear, um, then you want to stop moving it around because at that point you're going to be clouding it up. It's kind of starting to become tacky. And if you move it while it's tacky, then it loses some of its sheen. Now, if you're really worried about the color bleeding and you want to get more layers of the clear coat on there to penetrate down in it, you want to apply more of it while it's still white so that it can continue to absorb it. So you're basically adding more liquid to it while it's liquid. Uh, if you don't want it to be absorbed in there because you want it to sit on the top, 
because you want to add to the luster. What you want to do is you want to keep it moving around until it's clear and then let it dry for just a moment. Then you can add another layer on top of it and let it dry and that'll just make it a whole lot shinier. Bubbles are kind of your enemy in this. So you want to move it linearly, like linear strokes, uh, until the bubbles get really, really, really fine. And those little fine ones will get absorbed. Where, but if you have large standing bubbles, you'll actually be able to see them in the clear coat. All right. And that's pretty much all there is to that. Got a little bit of drying time, then we lace it up like a shoe, and that's more or less got it. So there's our finished product. Uh, if you learned something new, give us a like, and if you would like to see more videos like this in the future where we tackle some progressively more difficult projects, uh, be sure to hit the subscribe button, and we will see you next video.